What's up, guys? J Hold on. Oh, man. Again, I went small and I can't go large. Can you guys see me? I'm on the picture frame right, right up top. The, the one on the left. Well, my left. Which would be your right, I think. Oh, man. Oh, man. How, how do I get this thing to work? What's up guys, James here from Reflect the Screen, and today I review Ant-Man and the Wasp, which is the sequel to the self-titled Ant-Man film. This one follows the events of Civil War, it definitely reminds you of that, believe me, there's plenty of, remember what happened after Germany, remember you broke the Soviet Sokovia Accords, sorry I can't really remember, the this movie's kind of all over the place, just like that sentence was. Let's dive into the story a little bit. The film opens up with Scott Lang and his daughter Peanut playing a game, I guess, with Michael Pena's character kind of doing work on the side and controlling some cardboard ant. It's a maze and they're trying to have fun because Scott can't leave. Our hero has an ankle monitor on after he violated the Sokovia Accords and honestly, if he does leave, he goes to prison for life. So it's wait three more days or go to prison for life. You decide. So it's funny because the film starts playing with time and space and the different constructs and it seems okay at the beginning. It really does kind of work a bit. Of course, the film introduces our villain, our antagonist, Ava, who's known as Ghost. She's, well, got a suit of her own, and she's phasing in and out, so you kind of can't catch her, and well, here we go. This is the threat. So the film centers around Scott trying to help Hank and Hope get to their... So the film is kind of basic on the surface level. I mean, it doesn't need to be too, I guess, layered. The only thing is, the film feels shallow. Hold on, I'll explain. The film is pretty much a mess all around. I mean, the writing is definitely one thing that I was curious about going into this movie. In the first film, we see Edgar Wright's script kind of leak into Peyton Reed's final cut of the film. Remember, Edgar Wright was supposed to be the director. They fired him, but Marvel kept most of his script, which made the first very unique, very fun, very different. It didn't really feel like a superhero movie. It felt more like a heist film. But in this one, even though Peyton Reed is back in the director's chair, the writers are just, mmm. Mm -mm, mm -mm. This is just so lacking in so many areas. Like I said, it's shallow, it's surface level, and all the humor really strikes out more than it hits. Which is surprising because Chris McKenna and Eric Summers, both writers that are credited on the film, they worked on Spider-Man Homecoming. They worked also on Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. They worked on the Lego Batman film too. So you would think that the humor would transcend into Ant-Man 2, and it doesn't, unfortunately. As for the acting, I personally was very excited for Walton Goggins' character, uh, Sonny Birch. He's a villain. He wants to buy this weird device and then he gets involved in the lab that shrinks. You'll see it in the film, but he's another antagonist. The only thing is, they misuse him completely. But he's not the only one they misuse. They also misuse Lawrence Fishburne's character, Dr. Foster, and they also misuse Ava. So this film is just hit, missing the mark in the first half. I figured, okay, after the first half woes, maybe the second half will kind of get the ball rolling. Unfortunately, there's nothing that can save this film. It's not a terrible movie. I'm making it sound like it's a horrible film, but it's not that bad. I cracked a smile, I laughed every now and then, but the movie just too many times fell flat. There were so many lulls in the second half of the film, even in the middle of the action, I felt like nothing was really resonating with me. And I think it goes back to Marvel treating this really like a throwaway film. This has no weight on the MCU, maybe in the mid-credits sequence, but honestly, there's no weight that this movie holds. It doesn't affect anything, it's inconsequential. You can honestly skip Ant-Man and the Wasp and be okay in the MCU timeline, which is disappointing for someone who's followed all of the films so far. Now what I will compliment Ant-Man and the Wasp on is pretty good CGI in most parts. I, I think that this is very impressive because for some reason, CGI in Marvel films as of late has been a little shoddy, very noticeable green screen, weird effects and chase sequences, but in this one it seemed just fine. Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly and even Michael Pena, they have good chemistry together and I think that they're the gems in terms of the acting in this film. But the, unfortunately, they're really, they're always next to worse actors. I don't want to say they're bad actors, because Michael Douglas is not a bad actor. But Michael Douglas and even Michelle Pfeiffer, they phone it in in this movie. There's not a lot of room for them to work. I feel like the script was a little too loose, and it didn't give them a lot of direction. And there's a lot of emotional moments in this movie that really don't work. They don't... Hit. I said it once and I'll definitely reiterate that Edgar Wright's writing style is definitely missed because I think that was really what pulled the first one together. And this one, it's just far too loose with it and it doesn't really pay off in the end. Speaking of the end, the end of this movie is absolutely horrible. I was left thinking, why are you glossing over a huge moment in the final act? Really? This is how you're gonna- 
And if I'm in my seat, drooping my head, and I'm just upset, that's not a good thing. At the end of, well, these kind of movies, at the end of Marvel films, you should be a little relieved, maybe happy, maybe questioning, maybe crying if you're watching Infinity War. But in Ant-Man and the Wasp, I never resonated with this ending, and I thought that it missed the mark again. And that's the constant trend here, right? Ant-Man and the Wasp is missing the mark. The action is fine for the most part. I didn't really find any issues with it. It wasn't very engaging. And it's possible that I the choreography was a little worse than the first one, but overall nothing really that, you know, you would sit there and yell at the screen for. There's other things, like that script. And another issue I had with this movie is that the first was unique because it set itself apart. This one plays to a bunch of superhero tropes, and I think that I'm tired of those. It doesn't distinguish itself, it's just another Marvel film. Now hold on, I know what you're thinking, another Marvel film, that can't be a bad thing. No, this is another Marvel film that falls in line with Thor The Dark World, Incredible Hulk, Iron Man 2. I mean, they're just forgettable. Granted, Ant-Man and the Wasp is a cleaner film, but I'd say it's on the same level as Incredible Hulk because nothing about this movie really stood out to me, and that's a huge problem. Man, this series deserves much better because I'm sure they'll make a third film, and if they don't, whatever but it said at the end of the film that Ant-Man and the Wasp will return, so I figure, okay, they'll return Avengers 4 and maybe another solo Ant-Man film, but if this is the trend and direction they're going in, I don't really care to see any more of Ant-Man, honestly. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Honestly, the film could have been much better, but please let me know what you think when you see it in the comments below. Give this review a like if you enjoyed it, and please subscribe for more content. However, there's a ton of stuff that I do online at reflectthescreen.com that doesn't make its way in front of the camera, so go ahead and visit the website and have some fun. Thanks so much for watching again, guys, and I'll definitely catch you at the next screening.